George? Mm. What's the big question? There's a lot of them. What's outside? What's beyond what the sensor can see? Why are we here? How long have we been here? How much time do we have left? What's the biggest one? What if everything you know to be true, everything you've been told by the people you love, was in fact just one big lie. That's kind of a rhetorical question, in it, George? But you get the idea, you veterans of a thousand psychic wars who have set the controls to the heart of the sun. What if? That's from the Gnostic-themed series, Silo. The plot details how humanity is trapped underground in a sort of metropolitan Plato's cave. Not exactly looking at shadows, but told that the outside world is too toxic to survive, and it must remain in the mass formation existence of basically living in pods, owning nothing, and sometimes even eating bugs never touching grass. Gee, no one would conceive of that in our world. That's demented. Lockdowns and toiling in the darkness in industrial and digital hellscapes? Nah, would never happen to us, only in science fiction. And what is any life if not the pursuit of a dream? What if the dream became a nightmare? because he really does feel that we're living in some kind of Orwellian nightmare now, and that everything that you hear now contributes to turning you into a robot. But as Ray Bradbury said, I don't write science fiction to predict the future, but to avoid it. Alas, the Gnostic nightmare has materialized, and we're one step from forever being placed in a silo of the mind and the body and the spirit without the amazing Rebecca Ferguson to save us. Yet we still can avoid the incoming, revamped Plato cave of the Demiurge, an eternal black iron prison. Birth is a curse and existence is a prison. So the rhetorical must be practical. And yes, we've been lied to about almost everything. Whether it's by the victors who write history, the spellcraft of technocrats, or even the eagerness of our own lizard brain ego wanting safety over freedom. We've been lied to, but now we wake up and continue our deprogramming at the virtual Alexandria. Think about it. We we understand life backwards, but it's got to be lived forwards. Ain't that the truth? No, no, it's a quote. Quick, who said it? You? As Alan Watts said, a scholar tries to learn something every day. A student of Buddhism tries to unlearn something daily. His or her Gnostic cousin would agree. We must both learn and unlearn every day. This makes us enemies of those trying to keep us in our silos our Plato's cave, our black iron prison. As Jung wrote, the deep critical thinker has become the misfit of the world. This is not a coincidence. To maintain order and control, you must isolate the intellectual, the sage, the philosopher, the savant, before their ideas awaken people. This will cause a mental implosion from lack of thought, stimulating conversations and interactions with others which will lead to their demise. That is one of the greatest tragedies of our time, the unwelcome thinker whose brilliance will never be known. 
What the ancient Hebrews were to Egypt and the early Christians were to Rome, we are now to this corrupt new American empire. It's an ancient fight, Nick. The values of the individual against the supremacy of the state. So welcome to A.M. Bite, you misfit, you dreamer, you pied piper at the gates of dawn. Welcome to that gnosis to avoid the future that Demiurge has in stall for us. We run with those searching for the truth and avoid those who have found it. We're writing our own gospel and living our own myth. I am still Miguel Connor, your pompadus of Gnosis. I am so happy we meet again, you shining crazy diamond who can bring so much wonder to the world. I just know it. Mr. Wolf, there are two turns of phrase a Klingon never admits to knowing. Defeat and farewell. As always, get ready for a show that helps you both unlearn and learn in a way the Buddhists and the Gnostic would want. For this, we have the honor of being joined by Andrew Collins, who will discuss his new book, The First Female Pharaoh. Andrew will provide a bevy of red pill suppositories and aeon probes, including mind-blowing revelations on the history of ancient Egypt that are relevant today. He'll reveal yet another avatar of the goddess that has been suppressed by orthodox powers, a woman who stands in impact alongside other censored history-changing figures like Hypatia, Mary Magdalene, Mary the Juris, Marcelina, Leontion, and others. But no more. And forget about ancient history, as Epstein angels have done well in erasing Blavatsky's contribution to humanity, or even Queen Elizabeth's penchant for alchemy and hermeticism. Marjorie Cameron still doesn't get the flex she deserves. Shit, the powers and principalities don't even want us to know that Harriet Tubman succeeded in her underground railroad for slaves because of her mystical powers. I'm not a witch, I'm not a witch. Uh, but you are dressed as one. They dress me up like this. Wow. <laughs> and this isn't my nose, it's a false one. Well, well, we did do the nose. The nose? And the hat, but she's a witch. But that's what they do, right? Erase the woman or erase the mystical, nature or the transcendent. So we accept the silo we're in and keep looking at shadows on the wall of the cave. And mind you, I'm no feminist, but I fight for truth, justice, and balance. The right kind, Anakin. The truth shall set us free, and the jailbreaking of the collective anima is part of this. If it can be destroyed by the truth, it deserves to be destroyed by the truth. And just as good, Andrew presents information that Gnosticism and Hermeticism aren't just direct heirs to the Egyptian mysteries, but might have originated almost 2,000 years before Jesus. Yes, the Gnostics and Hermeticists might be very old, old enough to be U.S. Senate leaders or run for U.S. President. Your booze mean nothing. I've seen what makes you cheer. Every breath I take without your permission raises my self-esteem. Maybe Peter Kingsley was right when he wrote, It's not that the Gnostics were Christian heretics. It's that the Christians were Gnostic heretics. But, as Gnostics have always known, things do tend to get turned upside down and back to front inside our topsy-turvy world. Jerry, just remember, it's not a lie if you believe it. I'll end with a small but, quote, unlearning sermonette from David Litwa's excellent Patreon, where he talks about the famous speech from Orthodox Jesus on the fishers of men in Mark 1, 17. He writes... Has anyone else contemplated the cruelty of this metaphor? What fish wants to be caught? And by, quote, caught, I mean speared through the side, hooked through the lip, stuck fast in a net, 
dragged out of one's life world and left to asphyxiate on the sand, gill seething in the open air. To quote fish for people means to hunt and kill them, and to deceive them with bait. Is it ever good to describe people as fish that are fished? Fish are basically defenseless creatures largely controlled by instinct, unable to learn that a floating worm hides a hook that tears through the lips loaded with nerve endings. Does pain make turkeys noble? Why is all of creation based on dog-eat-dog? Dog? And the little fish are eaten by the big fish. Animals screaming in pain. All of creation an open wound. A fucking slaughterhouse. The only Christian author to realize this cruelty of the, quote, fishers of men metaphor is the author of the Nag Hammadi Library's authoritative teaching, who writes... We do not fall asleep and forget about the nets, hidden from view, that are lying in place to catch us. For if we are caught in a single net, it will swallow us down within it, and water will wash over us and splash into our faces, and we shall be pulled down into the dragnet. Man-eaters will grasp us and consume us, and they will enjoy themselves like a fisherman who is casting a hook and line into the water. The fish smells the food and swims after the fragrance of the food, but when it bites into the bait, the hook hidden within snares it and draws it up by force from the deep water. Litwa concludes that the fisherman is an evil archon, bent on destroying the human race with the baited but bloody hook of pleasure. The only quote, fishers of men are evil. Am I evil? Worse, you're smart. When you know nothing matters, the universe is yours. And I've never met a universe that was into it. The universe is basically an animal. It grazes on the ordinary. It creates infinite idiots just to eat them. You know, smart people get a chance to climb on top, take reality for a ride, but it'll never stop trying to throw you. And eventually it will. There's no other way off. Nice Finding Nemo message, David. Let's get out of this silo and let us stop being hooked by Fisher of Men. We get closer with our interview with Andrew. When an atomic bomb detonates and then the radiation knocks the electrons right out of your bones, what do you want? To know who you are? To know what it all means? You'll be too busy vomiting up your organs. Culture doesn't survive. Cockroaches do. The second we stopped being cockroaches, a whole species went fucking extinct. Speak for yourself. I'm not you. Well, you might as well be. You can't fix a few millennia of broken DNA with a fucking hard drive. Why do you think you spent so much time in the goddamn human cities? You're right. There's a beauty to this world. An order. That's what we like to believe. We're not wrong. There is an order. A grand design. We made sure of that. It was a dream for so long, and we finally made it real. Not a better world. A perfect one. This is the Aeon Byte interview, and with us we have the pleasure of being joined by Andrew Collins to discuss a book I really enjoyed, and that is The First Female Pharaoh. Andrew, Thank you very much for coming on the show. Uh, yeah, thank you. It's my pleasure uh, to be here. Look forward to talking about that book and all that it implies. Yes, yeah, so this is an important book and an important and overlooked figure. So glad we could uh, bring her into the world. And with us, too, we've got uh, the Moondog Vance. Vance, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. Looking forward to uh, hearing about the first female pharaoh. I'm thinking Egypt is always fascinating and the Egyptian gods and so forth. So uh, definitely an item of interest. 
Yeah, exactly. Well, as somebody with Irish uh, Irish blood, I always thought the first female pharaoh was my mother, but now I realize we've got another figure here. So, and how do you uh, pronounce her name so we don't botch it up through the interview, Andrew? Well, I, I think if you say it slowly, it's Sobek Neferu, uh, which means the beauties of the god Sobek. Um, but if you say it fast, which I'll probably do uh, during the interview, it's Sobek, Sobek Nofru, um, which is the same thing, really, but just shortened. All right. Well, we'll do our best. And what drew you What drew you to write this book? Well, um, I mean, it's, it's a long, strange story, really, um, going all the way back to the 1980s. And um, what I was interested in is that people were having dreams and visions about this woman, um, Sobek Nofru, and, and this was something unusual. I mean, there are various other um, female pharaohs, of course, you know, Cleopatra, um, Nefertiti, mm -hmm. who reigned on her own maybe for a year or so, um, and Hapsat Shut. And these, you know, great women of history uh, are household names, and yet people don't have dreams about them. And this just intrigued me, That nothing more than that. I mean, they could have been people's imagination, but I was just intrigued as to why this particular name crept, kept cropping up, Sobek Nofru. Um, so I started looking into her and who she actually was. And what I found was that her story was quite extraordinary and had never, ever been told. And that in many ways, she changed the the, the, the complete fate and destiny of Egypt. Um, I say that because the story is that she lived uh, around 1800 BC, this being at the end of the 12th dynasty, um, also towards the end of what was known as the Middle Kingdom, uh, a very successful period of Egyptian history. Her father was a very successful king by the name of Amenemet the third um he ruled for about 45 years um and you know as i said he was very very successful and during his reign he basically invited um semitic peoples to settle in the northern part of the country and um they you know did various different skills everything from uh entering into the navy becoming bodyguards uh, controlling caravan routes um, they also seem to have been involved with engineering projects uh, and possibly even pyramid building, you know, as, as um, you know, skilled workers on that. But very gradually, they um, they became quite influential, possibly even within the court of the king. And towards the end of um, Amenemet III's reign, um, he did something that was quite unique. He set aside his, what well, we're going to assume is his eldest daughter, who's probably only about 16 to 18, to become the next ruling uh, pharaoh of Egypt. Now, her name was Neferu Ta, um, which honours the god Ta, which is a creator god. And, you know, she was even allowed to have her name in what's known as the royal cartouche, which is this oval that you put around the names of, of a you know, of, of a, a royal figure. Um, and it would seem that because she was young, um, she was going to rule alongside her younger brother, whose name was Amenemet the Fourth, and that they would rule together in what exact capacity, we don't know. Um, and that, you know, any children that they um, bore would, um, you know, would quite clearly uh, continued the, the dynasty. Now, all the information seems to suggest that they were from different mothers. So they, they were not, you know, direct, um, you know, blood uh, brother and sister from the same mother. They were from two different mothers. Um, but then tragedy struck because Nefertar dies. And we know this because there was a place that was uh, put aside in the tomb of her father which was a pyramid at a place called Hawara in the Fayum region which is about 60 miles to the south of Giza um, and evidence that her body was placed in there has was found various artifacts before it was removed from there and put in its own separate little pyramid 
um, just at the other side of of, of the pyramid field um, where she would rem- remain until her tomb was found in the 1950s. Although, unfortunately, because water had seeped into the tomb, her body was not found. Um, but anyway, so this sort of was a tragedy which nobody had really expected. So it would seem that Plan B had to be put into operation, and this was that Amenemet the Fourth would rule as the main uh, pharaoh, but with his other sister, his own blood sister, Sobek Nofru, ruling us alongside him, either officially or unofficially. Um, so this was the way that she herself rose to become, you know, a, a, a royal personage that would eventually go on to actually rule the country for four years. Mm-hmm. So anyway, it would seem as if brother and sister were very, very close and ruled together for the first few years of his reign. They even had twin pyramids made for them, for them, for each other um, at a place called Masguna. Uh, which is on the Nile, uh, on the on the, sort of the in the Nile, Nile Valley, and um, but then something happens. It seems as if the two fell out because of their political um, uh, motivations and whatever. It would seem as if the the Amun Emet himself tried to take the country even in more progressive directions, basically creating an, an open borders policy uh, and allowing more and more Semitic peoples into the country so that they became more and more influential and she would seem to have not gone along with this Um, I mean he also turned his back on what the ruling dynasty was doing at this time which was elevating the crocodile god Sobek into a state god he seems to have rejected this and gone back to venerating and honouring as a patron this god called Artum, who was the creator form of the sun god Ra. Um, And it seems as if certain nationalists in Egypt came to Sobek Nofru and basically said to her, look, we don't like the way that the country's going, and if it continues to go this way, the country's going to fall, quite literally is going to fall apart. Um, and they obviously said, look, you know, if you'll do something about this, we will support your claim to the throne. And unfortunately, this meant getting rid of her brother, in other words, murdering him. Um, and that this is indeed what happened. Now, whether this was done direct, well, whether she was directly involved in this or she just knew that it was going on, we don't know. Um, but what this then meant was that she took over the country bear in mind that she'd obviously partly ruled the country anyway alongside her brother so in other words she knew how to do it you know because otherwise there's no way that a woman in this capacity would have been able to take over the country um and she immediately stamped down her authority closed the borders um stopped trading with uh, Canaan and the the Egyptian Sinai um, and tried to shore up everything. And this essentially worked. The only trouble is that it seriously angered uh, certain priesthoods, most obviously that of the sun god Ra or Artem, which was at a place called Heliopolis. And one of the reasons for this was that they'd been gaining more and more power um through this in this the the semitic peoples coming in and yeah they didn't want to see this power taken away um so they almost certainly started speaking out against her and in year three of her reign there was particularly low nile floods now what this would mean is that seeds would not be able to be planted or 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 not correctly planted the following season because the nile floods bring with them this rich dark mud that covers the Nile Valley and is essential uh, chemicals and, and nutrients for the soil so that, you know, that that grain and, and stuff like this can be grown. And I think this was one of the things that was brought to the attention of the people. Look what this woman's doing. Um, you know, she she's her, her with her God, Sobek and whatever. 
Uh, well, obviously, we, we can talk about what she was doing with, with uh, the God Sobak. But what she was, what she also achieved at this time was that there were two sons. Now, we're not sure whose sons they were. They could well have been Amenemet, the false sons. In other words, her brother's sons. Now, they may even have been her own sons. We don't know. But they, she set them up as the first two kings of a new dynasty that would become known as the 13th. Okay. And they would rule that. They would honour her. They would deify her. They would honour the, the, the god Sobek. And indeed, that, you know, incoming dynasty, the full t- 13th, um, had at least five kings that all bore the name Sobek Hotep, which basically means um, uh, Sobek is pleased or he is at peace or something like this. Um, and the importance of all this is that these nationalists that came to Sobek Nofru were correct because within two to three generations, Egypt did fall. Um, what happened was that alongside the 13th, and please try not to get too confused, is that another dynasty rose up that ran concurrently with the 13th, and that, of course, was the 14th dynasty. This was a Semitic dynasty um, where, the, where the kings were either Semitic in nature or they, they were Egyptian with Semitic sympathies and progressive sympathies. And what they did was open the door for these warlords to come in from Canaan, who took over the country, they're remembered under the name the Hyksos or the Shepherd Kings. And they basically trashed the place, took over, and they forced the Egyptian nationalistic dynasty right to the south of the country into Thebes, where they would rule down there as quite a weak dynasty, mostly of princes for, uh, let's say, you know, 100 years or whatever, certainly around that time. But what happened, luckily, was that their descendants rose up eventually and booted out the war, the, these warlords, the Hyksos, from Egypt, beginning what was known as the New Kingdom, which started with the 18th dynasty. We won't worry about some of the other dynasties we've not mentioned. Um, and without Sobek Nofru, none of this would have happened. You know, she was the one that turned things around. If it had not been for her establishing the 13th dynasty um, and doing what she did, Egypt would unquestionably have fallen and probably ended up just being another city state forming part of Canaan. Um, And so, you know, she was a hero. I mean, she was quite literally a hero to her country. Um, The only trouble is that that's not the way that um, that history has remembered her, because but due pro- almost certainly to these priesthoods, you know, putting her down and what she what she did down, um, she eventually was vilified and her name completely ignored by certain king lists and quite clearly inscriptions in her name or monuments that were created by her were destroyed. I mean, including the pyramid that was intended for her, which was never used at a place called Mesguna. Um, this was destroyed to the ground. It was absolutely, to, you know, that no block was left in place above the surface. I mean, its substructure has been uh, investigated. That was investigated by a British archaeologist called Ernest McKay in 1910. And it's very complicated, very strange, completely different to many other pyramids um, and with, with, with unique features in it. But she was never buried there. She was buried almost certainly in secret by her, her closest followers. And even by the early part of the New Kingdom in the 18th dynasty, wherever she was buried had already been lost because there were people trying to honour her, going around looking at other tombs, you know, that, that were essentially contemporary to, to her reign, you know, leaving messages sort of, you know, giving her blessings and bigging her up and all the rest of it. So we know that at this time, people had all, no one knew where she was buried, or certainly not the public. I mean, presumably certain of her followers and their descendants may be, but the general public had, had lost it. And the, the interesting thing about this is that because of this, her name is essentially lost to Egyptian history. Um, I say essentially because we certainly know that 
one of the Egyptian female pharaohs that followed her, whose name was Hatshepsut, would seem to have honoured Sobeknofru and styled her own reign on Sobeknofru's reign. Um, this is something that's been noted by a number of scholars uh, and I think is absolutely correct. I mean, in ways which are, are quite bizarre. I mean, even down to the fact that on her sarcophagus, there were inscriptions that were um, like spells to enter into the afterlife that were more or less identical to those that were eventually found on the side of the sarcophagus of Sobek Nofru's sister, Nefer Neferu Tar, when her tomb was uncovered and it had not been previously disturbed in 1955. So, you know, where did where did this knowledge come from? Where did Hatshepsut get this knowledge? I mean, there is no answer, but it, it's quite clear that she wanted to align herself both in life and in death with Sobek Nofru and her family. So that's interesting. But coming forward in time is that there's, there's no mention of Sobek Nofru in Egyptian inscriptions right the way through to, you know, obviously Cleopatra and the end of dynastic history. And of course, there's then a period where nobody was probably even thinking about her, other than some stories and legends which we find in Arabic law that came from Egyptian Coptic tradition, which I, I'll probably come on to, and also from Greek tradition, which I'm certain relate to Sobek Nofru. But then we come into the 19th century and the early archaeologists that are doing work in Egypt suddenly start uncovering inscriptions mentioning her um, and also finding king lists that mention her. And of course, they're saying, well, who is this woman? She must have been important because she's she's got the honours of ruling Upper and Lower Egypt. So she was clearly, a, a you know, um, a female king. So a lot of speculation started to surround Sobek Nofru and um, you know, you'll find this in certain books by people like Heinrich Bruch, uh, um, a well-known Egyptologist. And then eventually more speculative works on Egyptology were produced by a guy called Gerald uh, Massey, uh, a, a London right. writer, a mythologist. And he you know, basically looked at her religious traditions and felt that one of the reasons why her life was suppressed is because she'd revived this very ancient star cult associated with Sobek, the crocodile god, and his mother, whose name was Neith. And now Neith is shown usually as a standing hippopotamus, and on her back is a crocodile representing her son Sobek. And this is a sky figure. It's associated with the northern part of the sky where it's connected with the stars of the constellations of Draco, the, the dragon, celestial dragon, known in Greek as Typhon, um, and also Ursa Minor, and also Ursa Major, of course, what we know as the, the Big Dipper or the Plough. Um, and um, these three constellations would seem to be associated with this, this combined sky figure. Um, and so. You know, Gerald Massey looked at this and basically felt that she was revived this ancient cult, which unquestionably it was. And this was one of the reasons why she was vilified. But also beyond that is that, you know, this, this these, these occult traditions were something that probably per permeated through, um, you know, secret societies and whatever, right the way through to the modern day. Uh, this was essentially something that, that he kick-started and other writers such as the occult author Kenneth Grant also suggested in various of, of his non-fiction books a uh, very influential occultist uh, who's you know still relevant today died a few years ago um, and all of this going back to around 1900 is something that was being taken in by a Irish novelist who had already had a successful book, which was Dracula. And his name, of course, was <laughs> Bram of course. Stoker. And he thought this woman, she's so intriguing, particularly all of her religious and magical ideas, that she'd make a good antagonist in an Egyptian novel. 
And this novel would appear eventually in 1903 under the name The Jewel of Seven Stars. Um, and it wasn't a happy book because at the end, you know, there's a lot of <laughs> yeah. do- doom, death and destruction. And when the book came out, it so shocked the Edwardian audience that the publishers called um, uh, Stoker in and said, look, you know, in subsequent editions, you're going to have to give this a happy ending. So he did. So if anybody intends reading this book, make sure that you seek out the first edition, because that's Uh, the real good, serious and interesting one. And I mean, the upshot of all of this is that Bram Stoker's book, The Jewel of Seven Stars, went on to influence the storylines of every film that you watch where an Egyptian royal female comes back from the dead to create havoc in the modern world. I mean, the latest of which was The Mummy, starring Tom Cruise in 2017. I mean, that unquestionably was inspired by Bram Stoker's book. But there are other ones as well, like 1980's The Awakening, which I personally consider to be the the best um, adaptation of Stoker's book. And of course, by virtue of that, the fictional representation of Sobek Nofru. But I mean, you know, that's that's basically her story. So, you know, she's a hero. She changed Egyptian history. And without her, we wouldn't have had all the great kings of Egypt, like Ramesses II, the Thotmosis, um, Akhenaten, Nefertiti, and of course, uh, Tutankhamun. I mean, you know, and without him, the world would be different anyway. We certainly wouldn't have had Art Deco in the uh, the 1920s and 30s <laughs> yeah. because all of that came um, as a result of the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb in 1922. So that's basically her story. So, you know, that's why I've written it, because nobody had put all this together. No one. Um, so that's what I wrote in The First Female Pharaoh. Um And it's a great story. I mean, if anybody ever wanted to take it up for a real, you know, sort of docu-drama, it would be a fantastic story. Oh, agreed. And thank you so much. That's a perfect summary about a very important, uh, not just female figure, but just figure in general, a giant, a towering individual. And uh, for the audience, uh, Andrew shows the archaeology and his visits. Uh, I mean, he he goes down there and sees all this uh, evidence about this uh, female pharaoh. So he's there embedded. I like to, Andrew, how uh, even though it's been almost 4,000 years ago, it seems the some things never change with human nature. The idea of the migrant worker and the Game of Thrones attitude that you have in politics. And it's just some things never change. But uh, yeah, you brought up uh, Sebek, the fierce crocodile god. I've yeah. done poetry on him, and he's not the kind of god I would want to run into in the street. Uh, tell us about uh, what drove it, which, of course, in ancient Egypt would be yeah. her theology, yeah. because you've got, you mentioned Sebek, but she was also a devotee of Hathor. Thought, you talk yeah. about the goddess, uh, the, yeah, you talked about the the fierce goddess Neith, you know, the mother yeah. of the snakes and crocodiles. Tell us about her theology. Yeah, um, well, I mean, obviously her name was Sobek Neferu, which means the beauties of Sobek. So that was her personal name. So she's going to carry that influence with her in whatever she's going to do. But it would seem as if before she had a chance to rise uh, to become you know, Pharaoh of Egypt, she was destined for a life in a temple somewhere. She was almost certainly training Uh, to become a priestess and all the indications are that this would this priestess would have been associated with the goddess Hathor Uh, now Hathor of course is the the divine mother of the pharaoh Um, every mother of of a pharaoh is considered to be uh, an incarnation of Hathor in fact her name Hathor means the the house of, of 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 Horus because and that's a reference, obviously, to her womb. Um, and so what's interesting here is that, you know, if 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 a mother, you know, is gets pregnant and she's going to give birth to the, 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 the eldest child of, of the pharaoh, then 
this is destiny that that child is going to become the next king. But with Sobek Nofru, she was not first, not second, but the third child. So, so that's obviously why she was, you know, probably packed off to the local, you know, um, temple <laughs> yeah. and, and where, where she would probably have, have stayed her whole entire life. But it would seem as if something happened to her that changed her destiny and made her, convinced her that, you know, she she was destined to rule the country. Now, I mean, what happened, we're not sure, but it seems to have involved some unorthodox rituals and ceremonies that were similar to what is known as the Hebsed Festival. Now, the Hebsed Festi- Festival is something that a ruling pharaoh undergoes after they have uh, ruled for around 30 years. Um, and it's deemed that by this time, they're obviously getting older. You know, are they of sound body and mind to continue ruling the country? So they undergo these different trials and tribulations, both physical and mental, most of it in public as well, because, you know, whole courts, Hebsed courts would be created for this purpose. Um, and at the end of it, it would be decided um, whether the, the the king would be able to continue ruling the country. But what's interesting is that the the divine personage that um, that gave the yay or nay over this was the goddess Hathor, um, and you know she would be the one that basically would say, "Yep, yep, he's good to go for for you know another five years, and then we'll do another." Hebsed festival and see if he's still you know or she obviously uh, is is of sound mind then and body but what's interesting is that one of the only statues that we have of Sobek Nofru and when I say of her I mean it's 99% it's her that's that's what we know is that she's wearing what's known as the Hebsed cloak now this is what's given virtually as a prize to the pharaoh, after he successfully completed the Hebsed festival, yet she's not only wearing it, but it would appear, and it's not me saying this, is archaeologists, uh, sorry, Egyptologists that, that have come to this conclusion, is that this is her coronation cloak. In other words, she was wearing the Hebsed cloak for her coronation. Now, that's completely unheard of. So why would she wear something that's normally only given to a pharaoh after they've successfully really? completed, they've said, after 30 years. And the only answer to that is that she she had clearly undergone rituals that she personally believed substituted for the Hebsed that gave her the divine right. When I say divine right, in other words, Hathor had given her the thumbs up that she could become pharaoh because, as I say, Pharaoh presided over the Hebsed festival. Um, and that's what she did. So, in other words, she felt justified herself to take the throne because she'd, you know, got Hathor's blessing through these unorthodox rituals. So, you know, there she was on the throne. And what she seems to have done is to make Sobek, the crocodile god, into the state god. In other words, he was the main god that was seen to be venerated in the country. But she seems to have gone one further because she set up this massive complex at a place called Hawara, which, as I said, is in the Fayum, which is about 60 miles south of Giza, which has come down to us under the name the Egyptian Labyrinth. Now, this was the original labyrinth, probably even before the Minoan Crete, Cretan version of it. And this was an incredible structure, which was seen in around 450 BC by the Greek historian Herodotus. And he describes it as more impressive than the pyramids and more and, and bigger than all of the main temples of Greece put together. So this must have been an incredible structure, even by 450 BC. And we certainly know from archaeological work in the 19th and early 20th century that her name was all over it, as well as her father. 
but not her brother. Her, his name does not appear anywhere at the labyrinth. I mean, there is one disputed uh, reference to it, but let's not worry about that. But, you know, it's clear that he did not want to be a part of this. He was doing his own thing. In fact, um, the evidence seems to suggest that he wanted to set up his own kingdom quite separate to Upper and Lower Egypt in the Sinai uh, around, weirdly enough, a um, this, this sacred hill that was sacred to the goddess Hathor, uh, a place called Salabat el Kadam. As I say, that's it. That's in the, the centre of the Sinai, very close to very important mines uh, where um, copper, malachite, and turquoise uh, were extracted, and they were put on um, caravan trains and you know the raw material taken back into Egypt. So this was a very rich resource, resource uh, for Egypt. Um, and it would seem as if her brother, Amenemet the Fourth, was trying to establish the, the, this new, you know, kingdom, literally, in the Semitic lands, because obviously all the peoples that, that lived there were Semitic. And it was obviously, you know, their families, their communities that were settling in the northern part of the country in what we now know as the, the Nile Delta. Um, and so basically she set up the labyrinth as the center of Egypt's religions. And what she did was, and is as all the evidence suggests, is that there were chapels in the labyrinth for every main god of Egypt relating to every district or in Greek, nom, N-O-M-E, every gnome of Egypt. And that priests and officials would have to come to the labyrinth, let's say once a year, maybe more, to pay their respects to their own God, whose spirit was the God Sobek, because Sobek was seen to be the first God. In fact, he was seen to be an incarnation of the sun God Ra. And it was considered that the sun God, at the end of the day, set, obviously in the West, but then assumed the form of the crocodile god, Sobek, to swim through the waters of the great lake of the Fayum, uh, which was anciently known as Lake Morris. Uh, today it's known as Burkett Karam. Um, and it's a huge, huge lake. And that the sun would swim as a crocodile, you know, as Sobek, through the waters. And then uh, uh, in the morning, he would come out onto the shores assume the form of the sun again and rise up into the sky. And this happened every day. But at the, at, at the point of creation, the first manifestation of the sun god was seen to be Sobek himself. So in other words, they saw this whole area of the Fayum as the, the, the centre, the omphalos, you know, the sacred centre of the whole of Egypt. They even moved the point of demarcation, like the, the latitude line, between Upper and Lower Egypt from Memphis, which was the old kingdom capital, not far from Giza, south way, all the way to parallel to the Fayum region. That's how much they believed that this was the place of creation. And I mean, so that the, the labyrinth became quite literally the administrative and religious centre of, of, of Egypt. I mean, there was a, a, another capital uh, at the country at this time, at a place called Itjaitawe, which was on the, um, the the Nile Valley itself, but that seemed to have a different function. But it would seem as if their certainly their religious traditions were all focused around the Fayum, and in particular, the, the 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 monument known as the Labyrinth. And I mean, when Herodotus went there in 450, I mean, not only does he describe it in the manner I, I've said. But he said that the underground was was virtually as, as big as, as as what was going on above ground. And the, within it, he says, were the tombs of kings, as well as, um, you know, uh, shrines to crocodiles and all sorts of stuff. And I mean, the, the king side of it has certainly never been established. However, the fact that the underground areas were used um, to um, in the cult of Sobek is n is not in doubt. I mean, a, a large number of statues all broken, I should point out, have been found at the site of the labyrinth, uh, mostly by the uh, the British Egyptologist Flinders Petrie, 
at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, so it's no doubt that this was a, a centre of Sobek, uh, but also that it was created by Sobek Nofru. As I mean, and yet interesting enough, the actual building started off as something else. It started off as the funeral complex of her father, um, Amenemet the third. You know, in other words, she was honouring him, and she also deified him. In other words, made him into quite literally, you know, a god. So that she, he was venerated within the labyrinth as well. So you know, that's that's what she was trying to do. So in some, in many ways, she was creating a form of monotheism, but in a clever way, a little bit like what Akhenaten would do hundreds of years later. But she she basically made Sobek into the state god and said, look, you know, you've all got your local gods. They've all got their own names, but their spirit is Sobek. You know, in other words, you can call them what you like, but they're really right, Sobek. Okay. Yes, uh, yes. And that's what she was doing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and, and the, the, the outcome of all this is, is that quite clearly the 13th dynasty that, that did follow her followed these traditions um even up to, certainly up to the point that they were forced into the southern part of the country and at this point i think the labyrinth the royal palace um in the fayum which is i think it was her royal residence the the temple of sobek uh, that was connected to the palace were all trashed completely um, and that was, you know, essentially the end of that. I mean, it was rebuilt. At, some of it was rebuilt at a later point. Certainly the labyrinth was rebuilt. Um, but, you know, that's what was going on essentially during her reign. But as I said, it wasn't just Sobek. Sobek had a mother. His mother was Neith, the, the hippopotamus god. And there's reference in the labyrinth to an obscure goddess whose name is Dekdechet. Um, it's the only reference to her, and it's very clearly a goddess. Um, and this term basically means the the big bosomed one, the, the 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 one whose bosoms you know hang down basically. And, and this is exactly the manner that Neith is shown. This standing hippopotamus is shown with these very long breasts, and that, in other words, it's an epi, epithet of her. Um, so there's no question that you know she venerated. Sobek, she venerated Neith as the hippopotamus, but also her personal god was Hathor. Now, the, the, the fierce, terrifying form of Hathor is Sekhmet. This is an anthropomorphic uh, goddess with the head of a lioness. Um, and she was seen to you know, reign terror on the world, you know, at, at certain points in the past. And it would seem as if Sobek Nofru associated herself with Sekhmet, and in particular the force associated with Sekhmet, which is Sekem, the word Sekem. That means something like mighty power or divine force, really. And it's the energy, if you like, that she needed to rule the country. Um, and, yeah, there, there's, there's, I mean, for instance, even her funeral complex, which we know the name of, was called Sekem Sobek Nofru. You know, in other words, um, you know, the, the, the mighty false Sekem, you know, the, that is Sobek Nofru. But this obviously brings us on to what happened to her body. Um, well, all the indications are is that I think she, she committed suicide. Uh, and the reason that she did this was because I think she'd done what she, you know, needed to do. And this was set up this new dynasty, the 13th. Um, and, you know, she changed around things in the country. She'd reestablished what in ancient Egyptian is known as Mart, M-A-A-T, which means basically um, cosmic harmony through truth and justice. And I think that having done that, she felt that she'd done enough in her reign in the knowledge that people were now coming for her. And just like Cleopatra, you know, um, almost a couple of thousand years later, you know, she did not want to be humiliated, dragged through the streets, and eventually, you know, probably publicly executed or whatever. Um, she decided that the best way was ritual death. In other words, 
uh, find your own way of entering into the afterlife. And I think that this was done probably through the use of hallucinogens, uh, which was almost certainly the same as what happened with Cleopatra, by the way. The whole story to do with her being bitten by an asp is purely a symbolic story um, because the asp is the symbol of the goddess Isis. Uh, Isis was the goddess of medicine and magic. Uh, and so, you know, and, and Cleopatra, for instance, was a devotee of Isis. So this whole story about the, the asp biting her is simply a parable to say that she probably used hallucinogens, in other words, oh, you know, plant magic, if you like, right. um, to, to enter into the next world. And the same happened with Sobek Nofru, I'm sure. Yeah, so the the chamber of ashes might be uh, not might be a little exaggeration, if you would. Um, yeah, what I find interesting, God, I mean, she's a, what a towering figure as you're talking about Andrew. I also beyond her intelligence, her mysticism, her uh, sight and intuition, I see her too as a. Uh, probably somebody who was breaking down all cultural norms as you write uh she is portrayed uh both wearing male and female clothes she yeah. was a devotee of nath who was a bisexual self-created goddess of war and hunt and off the segment all rules are out the door when you're dealing with segment mm -hmm. so i see and uh even uh the idea, obviously, we're looking at some primordial template of Artemis, war and hunting, and uh, Vance pointed out the seven stars of Pleiades are the helpers of Artemis. So she has this fierceness and this sort of androgyny that you get with cultural changing figures, whether it's Elvis or David Bowie or one of those. So do you think that was part of her essence, this sort of androgyny and anima-anima strength balance? I mean, it, it's difficult. I mean, yes, yes. Yeah, it might be just being really, romantic and reading into it. I mean, <laughs> you know, when we were going from so little, I mean, most of what we know about her personality comes from the statues that remain. And unfortunately, all of these were just, well, not destroyed, but broken uh, in antiquity. So we can see, for instance, in busts of her that, yeah, she was wearing partly male and partly female uh, costumes. In other words, she was trying to adhere to some of the male pharaoh traditions, but she was obviously bringing in uh, her own female, you know, the more feminine, the more female feminine side. Um, I mean, it was almost like a, a feminine masculinity, basically. In other words, a type of masculinity without a man, basically. Um, so, of course, a lot of these ideas resonate, you know, with modern feminism. Um, and that's great, you know, because I think that, you know, feminists today should look at people like Sobek Nofru just in the same way that they do Hapset Shut, who came, you know, quite right. a while after yeah. Sobek Nofru and say, look, you know, our call started with women like this, you know, who were quite clearly suppressed at the time. They were suppressed afterwards. They were even suppressed in the 19th century because when these archaeologists you know, were, were uncovering the inscriptions relating to Sobek Nofru at the site of the labyrinth, I mean, they seem to only be mentioning the, the inscriptions to do with her father as if like he was responsible for it all and essentially ignoring the inscriptions mentioning her. As if, like, well, she obviously just put the finishing touches on it, or, or, or on it. She, clearly, she didn't do anything, you know, too major there. I mean, she was a woman. You know what I mean? Um, unfortunately, that's the the nineteenth century attitude towards it. And I find what's so interesting about that is that since Sobek Nofru does become the role model for this antagonist in Bram Stoker's book, The Jewel of Seven, The Jewel of Seven Stars. I mean, what a lot of people have said is that the character of Queen Tira, who what is the name given to, let's say, Sobek Nofru in Stoker's book, is an image of what's known as as the, the uh, oh, sorry, I've forgotten the, the term now, the, the modern woman, basically, mm, uh, of, okay. in, in Victorian times, which is like the precursor of, you know, a feminist in Victorian England. And that, uh, you know, certain commentators on Stoker's work have actually said that that's what he was trying to show 
is the that you know for the victorian society that the men were in fear of the, the you know the, the rising of the new woman you know the modern woman um there and that stoker was trying to you know show show this within the character of queen tira and i think it's to, to some degree um, it's probably true it's probably quite true i think that you know men did fear you know that the rise of women and how strong and how important they were becoming um, because it was so alien as far as they were concerned to their, you know, their cherished lifestyle. Um, and, you know, this is something we can obviously understand. Um, but, of course, you know, is, is very outdated in, in, in modern society. So, Andrew, uh, people can find you as simple as andrewcollins.com. We'll have it on the show notes. Uh, anything else you want to send the audience to or where should they get your book primarily? Well, um, obviously, the first female pharaoh, um, Andrew Collins, available now from Amazon or any good online bookstore. Um, and we, we're we going to Egypt in November, if you want to come along with us. And, you know, one of the subjects will definitely be going to the sites associated with Sobek Nofru. And we're going to try and find her tomb. I mean, whatever that means. Uh, clearly, we can't <laughs> go digging, but um, we can certainly come up with some good ideas. Um, so, yeah, come along with us. All details are on andrewcollins.com. I do it in association with me- with Megalithomania, and my colleague Hugh Newman. Um, and we're also going to Turkey. The, my other hat that I wear is obviously all the new discoveries going on in southeast turkey right now places like gebekli tepe karahen tepe i've just delivered a new book on kara tepe uh to the publishers uh in the traditions which will come out uh, next year um so yeah i'm sure i'll be on next year talking about that i hope so yeah very excited yeah we might join you I know I have to go to Memphis, Tennessee on a tour, but I might want to go to Memphis, Egypt, too, <laughs> and check it out uh, or, or wherever you're going. But awesome. Well, first of all, Vance, thanks for uh, keeping us company. Oh, no problem. It's great and fascinating to hear about uh, Sobek Neferu, who made Egypt great again. <laughs> he did. Indeed, yeah. But thanks for her contribution. And Andrew, thank you very much for bringing this book to light. It's a very important book, uh, whether you're into history, mysticism, uh, anthropology, sociology, it's an important book. And thank you very much for coming on the show. And we certainly look forward to uh, whatever else you discover in the future. Thank you very much, guys. Woo! Andrew bring us jaw-dropping revelations. It's raining noses, hallelujah. In our second part, Andrew speculates on whether the biblical Joseph and Sobek Neferu rub shoulders. Andrew will get more into Sobek Neferu, Bram Stoker, and modern occultism tapping into Egyptian gnosis. Mind-blowing stuffy stuff. Then Andrew will provide the evidence that Gnosticism and Hermeticism are even older than we thought, possibly going all the way back to Sobek Nefru's bloody father. He'll certainly expand on how Sobek Neferu is relevant today, beyond just for women, and how her rule saved the ancient Egyptian lore we love, maybe even civilization itself, and much more. So please become a member for the full Gnostic Rosetta Stone. It's only $6.99 a month at AB Prime or $4.99 a month at Red Circle, or whatever you want to pledge on Patreon. You'll get access to my private Facebook group and Discord channel for AB Prime members and higher level Patreons. If you find value in this content, please help grow this Red Pill Cafeteria. Your help can be in the form of a one-time donation on Stripe or the U.S. mail or even crypto. There is also a link on the show notes if you want to leave a tip or you can tip on any YouTube show. There's always the merch store and an Amazon wish list. And consider the Finding Hermes program, where we have monthly exclusive meetings and presentations with many past guests hanging out there for high-octane gnosis. I also have a one-on-one tier if you want to talk every month about Gnosticism or other heresies, or discuss healing modalities or addiction recovery. 
If you need help with uh, any of these choices, just message my ass. I'm always here to help, and I truly appreciate your help. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being yourself, your true self, here in the desert of the real. Hello and goodbye, as always.